welcome to this online roundtable on the education for refugees in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. This issue is one that affects the very foundation of the multilateral project, our engagement for human rights. All too often, the most vulnerable are left behind in the fraternity of humanity and the solidarity of nations. And this is especially true for refugees. Millions of lives have been suspended, even destroyed, and this should spur us to action. According to the last report by the UN Refugee Agency, 79.5 million people around the world, that's 1% of the global population, have been forced to leave their homes. These numbers are unprecedented and have doubled in less than a decade. This is why the United Nations urged the international community to take action on this issue by adopting the Global Compact on Refugees at the General Assembly in 2018. Much work remains to be done. Even before COVID-19, refugee children were twice as unlikely as other children to attend school. Four million of these children, aged between five and 17, did not attend primary or secondary education. And only 1% embarked on higher education, severely limiting their chances for the future. These figures are improving thanks to the combined efforts of governments, of civil society and the education community working alongside the UNESCO. But these figures also show that inequalities continue to be a major issue and that we urgently need to step up our efforts. This is why UNESCO has made education for refugees, displaced persons and migrants, one of our priorities, along with education for girls and women and higher education. First, through our UNESCO Institute for Statistics and Global Education Monitoring Report, we produce data and monitor the education progress of vulnerable populations, including refugees. Our Institute for Statistics is collaborating with UNHCR to improve the quality of data available and develop regular sustainable international reporting in this field. Second, we work for the recognition of refugees' qualifications. As part of the implementation of the Global Convention on the Recognition of Qualifications Concerning Higher Education, which uh, facilitates student mobility, the UNESCO Qualifications Passport is a very promising tool. It was launched in Zambia last year, and it recognizes the prior learning and skills of refugees and migrants, allowing them to pursue further studies or employment. We plan to accelerate its implementation in other countries so that refugees' skills cannot be denied. Because when people find themselves uprooted in countries where they do not speak the language, a passport like this is more than just a regular administrative document. It is a path towards a brighter future. And third, through UNESCO's International Institute on Education Planning, we support education ministries with crisis-sensitive educational planning to better integrate refugee education into national systems and legal frameworks, helping to ensure the right to education. UNESCO also offers policy guidance to host countries on how to manage the teachers of refugees, including integration, certification, teacher support, and career prospects. We're providing such a support, for instance, in Ethiopia, Jordan, Uganda, and Kenya. This uh, mobilization for refugees is all the more urgent as they are particularly vulnerable to the COVID-19 crisis and its consequences. In addition to being physically unable to apply health measures, refugees often live in very precarious housing and hold down casual jobs. And as such, they are more likely to be affected by the impact of the crisis. They are also very often targets of racism and hate speech. And in this way, the crisis is also jeopardizing all the work we have done to defend education for refugees and migrants. And it is because of these risks that UNESCO, uh, in its role of coordinator of the international response to the COVID-19 education crisis, has put a very special emphasis on vulnerable population. But we must think ahead and at the global level about how we will recover from this crisis. And today's meeting 
organized with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, whom I thank very sincerely, is very important in this respect. Our partnership with UNHCR is essential and has proved to be effective during this crisis. And I welcome their membership as well in the Global Education Coalition. I would like to thank uh, very specially UNHCR Special Envoy Angelina Jolie for moderating this meeting and more generally for her dedication to this cause. I would also like to thank the education ministers taking part in this discussion. Your presence here today reflects your commitment, your conviction that multilateralism, when based on transparency and respect, can help us rise to this immense challenge. And lastly, I would like to thank all the qualified refugees who will soon tell you their stories. Their testimonies are extremely valuable and they will play a key role in our reflections. I wish you all a very fruitful uh, uh, debate as we reflect on ways to ensure that education truly leaves no one behind. I thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much to the Director General for opening this session and thank you to you all for, for waiting while we organise our technical issues. Um, it's a real pleasure to be at this high level roundtable. Um, I'm Becky Telford, the Chief of Education at UNHCR and my role is just to support the moderation. Um, and in that role, I'm really delighted to hand over to Karina Gould um, for some opening remarks. She is the Minister of International Development with Canada. Wonderful. Well well, thank you so much, uh, Becky, for that. And thank you, uh, Audrey and UNESCO, and of course, Filippo and UNHCR uh, for hosting us and bringing us here today. I am delighted to co-host this important event with the United Kingdom. As Canada's Minister of International Development, education for refugees and displaced children is at the very heart of my mandate. I'm pleased to be joined by Baroness Sag, UNHCR Special Envoy Angelina Jolie, and all of our roundtable discussants, including ministers of education from three refugee hosting countries, Cameroon, Pakistan, and Kenya. I'm especially happy that we are joined by students who are refugees. You and your voice and your experience matter, and we need to hear your story because you are the reason we are all here today. It is your life, your future we are working for. Also, allow me to acknowledge the teachers too. Without teachers, there is no education. You play a vital role as educators. The education of displaced children and adolescents is deeply personal to me. My grandfather wanted to become a lawyer and my grandmother was looking to finish high school in Czechoslovakia when their lives were upended and forever changed by the Holocaust. While my grandmother found refuge in the United Kingdom, she never did go back to school. And though my grandfather miraculously survived a concentration camp, his dream of law school became a distant and painful memory. When they were reunited, they just needed to make a living. Pursuing an education would have to be for the next generation. My family was fortunate to build a new life in Canada. I was brought up to be immensely grateful for the opportunities this country has provided me which is why I and so many Canadians feel so strongly about supporting refugee and displaced children wherever they are in the world. We know the value each child and young person brings to a society, and we know the potential that can be unlocked through education. Every child deserves that chance. We all agree that every child deserves a quality education in an environment that is safe and inclusive, even in the midst of a pandemic. That's why the launch of the COVID-19 Global Education Coalition was very timely to ensure that ministries of education can get the support they need to manage their response to the pandemic. School closures have disrupted more than just education. Instead of benefiting from school feeding programs, 370 million children are facing food insecurity. Instead of experiencing a safe environment at school, children and youth are more vulnerable to sexual and gender-based violence and abuse at home. This reality is further compounded for refugees and internally displaced persons. These children are missing out not only on education and meals at school, but also a safe place to grow up and thrive. Sorry, I...
Guided by feminist principles, Canada believes in the value of gender equality, and we are taking action to promote the empowerment of women and girls, as well as LGBTQI individuals and other marginalized people. Countries needed to take stringent action to stem the spread of COVID-19, but school closures threaten to roll back gains that have been made in recent years, particularly on gender equality. When girls' education is disrupted, it can have drastic consequences. A girl is forced into marriage, an adolescent girl gets pregnant, and a young woman has to work to help her family pay the bills. As we learned from the Ebola crisis, these girls often never return to school. It all adds up. The disruption in education programs that also support the prevention of violent and harmful practices has led UNFPA to predict 13 million additional cases of child, early and forced marriage in the next decade. That's a frightening statistic. 13 million additional cases. 2020 is supposed to be 30. COVID-19 threatens to substantially set back progress we have made on the sustainable development goals. So how do we ensure that valuable gains in education are not, not lost? We must focus on the most vulnerable and marginalized children and youth and dismantle the barriers that prevent them from learning. This means in particular reaching those who may not have had access to education before the pandemic, like refugees and IDPs, and providing them with a quality education. We need to champion innovative, inclusive approaches that reach the most marginalized. This could mean low-tech solutions for remote learning, such as radio and printed learning materials, to reach learners in area with little or no connectivity, and improving the quality and accessibility of digital and mobile learning platforms. In my visit to the Democratic Republic of Congo, I saw firsthand how simple low-tech solutions like radio can transform the lives of children and adolescents affected by conflict to continue their education in a safe environment. Today, I'm pleased to announce increased funding of $5 million for projects in conflict-affected and fragile states, including radio-based education for girls and boys in the DRC. We must support the world's most marginalized children and youth, get back to school and get back to learning. And this includes the 3.7 million refugee children who were missing out on an education before the pandemic. All refugee and displaced children deserve a good education. We need to ensure that refugees and IDPs are included in national responses and data collection in order to see what is really happening on the ground. To this end, in line with the spirit of the Global Compact on Refugees, I applaud the pledges made at the Global Refugee Forum, including by refugee hosting country governments to support the inclusion of refugees in national education systems. We thank these host communities for all that they've done and all that they continue to do. Despite all the challenges during this forced pause, we also have an opportunity to do more, to come back better than before. We can use it to strengthen national education systems and build capacities in host communities to ensure they're providing high quality education, are more inclusive for refugees and IDPs, and more equitable and more resilient over the long term. Let's use this rare pause as an opportunity to ensure every child, including refugees and IDPs, around the world can go to school so that their dreams for their future, even when disrupted by conflict or displacement, can be pursued. That is what I look forward to discussing today and to hearing the incredibly important voices of our student panelists and their dreams for their future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Gould. That was fantastic. Thank you for your personal story um, and also for setting out the framework um, of the meeting that we have here today. Um, with that, I would like to hand over to Angelina Jolie, the UNHCR Special Envoy, uh, to give us some further opening remarks. Thank you. Well, good, good morning. Good morning for me. Good afternoon. Good evening to depending on where you are on Zoom. Um, thank you all for, for being here. Um, as we all know, children in all countries are struggling with the effects of COVID-19. An entire generation of children have had their education severely disrupted. Over a billion young children worldwide. We're meeting today to discuss how to prevent this disruption from becoming permanent for millions of refugee children. 
If you were a refugee child before the pandemic, you were already twice as likely to be out of school than other children. UNHCR has worked with the Malala Fund to model the possible impact of the virus. And the study found that there is significant risk that half of the girls who are currently enrolled will never go back to school at all. There is one, uh, one particular refugee child who epitomizes this, this risk for me. Her name is Holly. She was nine years old uh, and playing in her garden in Syria when their house was bombed, uh, killing her mother, forcing her and her siblings to flee to Lebanon. By the time she was 11, when I first met her, her days were spent fetching water and searching for fuel and cooking for her family. She stopped going to school. And while she was in her teens, she was married and already has her first child. Millions of refugee children around the world will face these kinds of life altering pressures as a result of the pandemic and the economic crisis. COVID-19 is proving to be an incredible catalyst for science and discovery and innovation. And if we could do the same for education, harnessing new technologies with the power of government and private sector funding and the energy and the drive of millions of talented young people it would be one of the greatest single inoculations imaginable against poverty and the denial of rights worldwide. And of course, there isn't one solution that fits all settings. On one hand, there are amazing new technologies available to support distance learning. On the other hand, many children don't have access even to TV or radio let alone a laptop or Wi-Fi. 80% of students in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, have no access to internet. So there is a very real digital divide within as well as between countries. So we have to consider what technologies work best in individual settings, from text message services to radio, TV, internet, the needs of children with disabilities, the part that hunger plays in damaging children's ability to learn, the role of teachers and the support they need to keep on going and many, many other issues. So I hope, I hope very much that this coalition can be the start of identifying solutions and models that work. And then that can be scaled up on a global level urgently. To my mind, there's one fundamental question in this. Because of how the world so often speaks of and, and talks about refugees, do we allow them to regard refugees as a burden? Or do we help them to see that they are individuals with huge potential? who if given the right tools can develop their minds, contribute to society and help stabilize their home countries. So for me, there's only one answer there. There is no better investment than we can make. And of course it is also their basic human right that must not be denied. So thank you. And I look forward to this discussion with all of you. Wonderful. Thank you, Special Envoy, for that uh, inspiring speech and for being here with us today. It's really a pleasure. Um, you talked about the millions of talented young people, and I think it's it's hugely important to focus on the contribution um, that many refugees are making to their communities. Uh, and I'm particularly delighted to now turn to Bahati uh, Ernestine to help focus this session on that question. Um, Bahati, can you tell us a bit about your own story um, and about how education has enabled you to play a really active role uh, in helping others during the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you, Becky. 
And hello, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to speak before you all today. Um, I was born in Rwanda, but came as a refugee to Kenya with my family in 1996. I was able to complete my primary and secondary education in Nairobi and won a Duffy scholarship in 2014, which has enabled me to follow my dream and study nursing. Studying a health related topic is the main choice of field of studies in the Duffy program globally. And uh, over 20% of the Duffy students have done the same like me. And we can all now contribute and in the future to strengthen the health systems in the countries that host us and our countries of origin. I have always been passionate about giving back to the community. As well as studying, I helped raise money for high school students' books, clothes, mathematical sets, and supply of sanitary pads, and advocate for people with serious diseases while educating them and groups at risk on prevention through positive lifestyle changes. During this time of COVID-19, I have been working as an intern nurse in Nairobi, working on the front line of the health response and being able to help others. I have also been part of the Hashtag For You campaign that is a youth-led initiative to highlight contributions of refugee youth to the COVID-19 response. All over the world, young refugees volunteer like me to support the emergency response. We have communication officers who fight against fake news, students who raise funds to support vulnerable families from refugees as well as host communities, and others who have produced masks and soap and distributed them among communities. I would encourage you to also share a video with the hashtag for you and give concrete examples on what everyone can do to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to thank those who have made this possible for me. My parents, UNHCR, the Duffy Scholarship Program, and the Kenyan government. And I call on those on this round table to realize that we stand to lose if refugee girls like me cannot return to school. Where will the next generation of nurses or volunteers come from? By coming together, we fight the pandemic and the impact on some of the world's most vulnerable people, if only we together. Thank you. Thank you, Bahashi. That was perfect. I mean, your commitment to service is so inspiring. It's a real pleasure to have you as part of this conversation. Um, and I think it's a, a timely reminder as well that education, um, we often think about basic education and we're speaking a lot today about secondary but actually access to tertiary is incredibly important. Um, we know that qualifications of refugees are sometimes not recognized in countries of asylum, which can be another barrier to continue study or access to the labor market. Um, the director general in her introduction talked about the UNESCO qualifications passport, which is an important initiative launched in cooperation with UN. HCR, which really looks at the qualifications frameworks for refugee students who have maybe had to flee without their diplomas. Um, Bahati mentioned she grew up in Kenya and that's where she is now. The government of Kenya has long hosted refugees and is one of the top 12 refugee hosting countries. During the COVID-19 pandemic, all schools across Kenya were closed, um, impacting around 15 million children, including almost 160,000 refugees. The Kenyan government pulled together very quickly an emergency response plan with four pillars, including an immediate response to the continuity of learning, all the way through to a post-COVID plan that looked to build back better, including with improved wash facilities um, or ensuring that students can catch up on skills that they've missed. I'm really pleased to introduce Ms. Nerea Olik, Kenya's Acting Director on Primary Education. Ms. Olik, the focus of this session is, is focusing on how uh, the international community to, can respond to exactly the needs that you've identified in those four pillars from continuity of learning all the way through to the return to school and how we can include refugees in national systems and responses. Can you tell us about the approach that you took in Kenya and any lessons that others might learn from this? Okay, thank you so much representing uh, the Ministry of Education. Uh, I think I'm here because uh, I've, uh, on the behalf of the Ministry, I've uh, dealt a lot with the issues of the refugee uh, in Kenya. 
uh, particularly the Kakuma uh, refugee camp. I visited the place several times to see how they are doing and how education that we offer impact on them. Basically, uh, when uh, the pandemic came up around uh, 15 uh, million learners in Kenya generally and out of school, all of them are now at home, uh, including uh, around 16,000 uh, refugees uh, who joined the rest uh, being at home. But in Kenya, we have uh, several mitigation factors that we put in place to ensure that uh, they do not just stay at home, but they keep uh, a pace with what uh, education is, the learning is. Uh, one of the areas that we've uh, done, uh, especially in our primary and secondary schools, uh, is uh, e-learning. And e-learning, we know that we have uh, various geographical uh, differences, and therefore we do not have a uniform way of transmitting information or uh, the content to all of them. Through our cloud, we have several uh, ish, uh, areas that we've looked into. One, we've allowed all the learners to have the learning materials with them at home. And secondly, uh, we also use uh, the AD channel, which is a channel that we use that is uh, embedded in our cloud, the Kenyan cloud, to pass information uh, to the learners who can be able uh, to get that. We also have the radio channels uh, to reach those remote parts of Kenya that may not be able to be connected to the internet. We also have the text message that we use to give the learners information on what they need to learn uh, through their head teachers, through the telephone lines that they've given to their, from their parents and their neighbors. Uh, for the refugee uh, camps, uh, we know that the learners are home, but the same uh, has been done to them. Our virtual learning is still going on and we still give guidance just the way we would give uh, during the normal uh, learning sessions. Uh, we have the materials with them uh, we made arrangement to give uh, to give them the materials at a subsidized rate that the Kenyan government also pay uh, for the production uh, of these uh, materials. Uh, when we got uh, some uh, uh, some leverage from uh, Mpesa, we did not exclude the refugee girls because we know what the girls in a normal situation face the refugee girl faces the same uh, more twice in a more challenging situation. So we also gave them sanitary pads to keep them uh, going, that was last year. We equally did distribute sanitary pads this year though, by the time most of the suppliers were reaching uh, some part remote areas of the country, uh, the learning had been suspended. But so far, uh, we have done what we can. We know we have a lot of challenge that is going on right now. We are still struggling with the issue of the high pregnancy rates in the country, uh, which has really spiked uh, during uh, this uh, uh, the, the COVID period. We also have reported cases of uh, forced marriages, uh, early marriages, which we know that does not exclude the refugee girls uh, in the camps. We also have sexual abuse and even rape in some cases. So as a country, we are trying to do the much we can to protect the Kenyan child and the refugee child, especially the girl child and even the boy child to ensure that eventually when things normalize, uh, this child will be able to go back to school. Uh, today in the morning, we had a meeting and our meeting was basically to track on our girls particularly because we know that they are most vulnerable. So we have sent out information so that we get the conditions and the status in which our girls are, uh, both in the refugee camps and our normal learning institutions. So for those ones who may be through bad luck, uh, be in a state that is not normal, that may be through pregnancies, uh, uh, we, we, we are ensuring that when we open our schools, whichever time, that the Ministry of Health will guide, we will be able to ensure that they go back and complete their studies. Uh, so far, uh, Kenyan government have been very much particular uh, on the refugee uh, education. And that is why we have even the technical uh, staff giving guidance. 
that is why we have even the technical staff uh, advising on the curriculum and also supervising what is happening uh, in these uh, camps and in the learning institution. Uh, I remember we visited together with the, uh, the, the minister uh, for education, uh, the uh, principal secretary uh, for education, uh, those uh, refugee camps, especially the one in Kakuma, just to find out the state of the learning uh, progress in those areas. And we were very much impressed by the role the teachers are playing, by the role the community is playing, by the role the parents are playing. Are playing. Of course, we got some unfortunate cases where we found some girls uh, during the process either got married or uh, became pregnant, but we realized that there is a way, a very, very much uh, a structure to ensure that these girls complete their studies. And we got some of the brightest girls from uh, these uh, camps. And we are very, very much impressed. We are encouraging them. Uh, we visited them like, uh, like I visited them like three times, talking to them and the passionate in which they have to learn and even to give back to the country. And even when they eventually their countries uh, you know, have the normal situation, and even those who stay in Kenya, I think uh, we are happy as a nation uh, to host them. Currently, we are working on how to normalize uh, our education system and the benefit that the Kenyan child gets uh, to be on the same level, like the one, the way we are also going to uh, treat uh, the refugee child. We are working on that policy. It is still on course. It's unfortunate that uh, most of our officers had to leave the office due to the COVID-19 uh, when, uh, when it was uh, actually uh, announced and they were told that uh, we can keep off. So it stopped the process a bit, but I'm sure that now that we are back in the office, we will be able to have that refugee, I mean, the policy guidelines on the refugee education in Kenya, which harmonizes what they learn with what we learn and ensures that our teachers, the teachers in the refugee camps get what also our teachers get. We had also organized and trained. We have our new uh, curriculum, curriculum uh, competency-based curriculum, and the learners in the refugee camps in grade one to four, and the teachers who are handling them have already gone through the training. So if those teachers now to leave the refugee camp to come to our normal school, they will still do the same thing because they are all at par. Despite the, the, the differences in their training from their various countries, but I believe we are moving together and uh, that, is our, that is our desire that moving forward, there will be no difference in what we offer and what the refugee child in Kenya offer. It is already on course. And uh, that is why we also give them our examination, those ones who are at the examination level. Uh, and moving forward, I think things will be very, very much okay once the policy is in place. So that is uh, my comment. And I'm so happy to have learned of our dear graduate from Rwanda, who is so much uh, full of praise of Kenya and has really benefited from uh, our, our generosity and our a good environment that we've created for them. And we are looking forward to have more and giving back to the society. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Kenya really has done so much for refugees. Uh, we mentioned at the end there your generosity. And I think from UNHCR, we really thank you for your continued engagement and support. Um, you also touched on some of the, the activities which have been done for continuity of learning and some of the opportunities that have taken up in Kenya on e-learning, uh, to leverage technology, and to understand uh, what the options are where people maybe are not as able to have access to the digital um, hardware or connectivity as they do in other places. UNHCR has worked with a number of partners over the years to look at uh, bringing technology to refugee hosting schools. Um, and we've learned a lot of lessons about the kind of approaches which can successfully link to national systems um, and support access to quality education for refugees and for host communities. One of these partnerships is with Vodafone, who are also members of the UNESCO-led Global Coalition. To date, UNHCR and the Vodafone Foundation 
have deployed 36 instant network schools um, throughout refugee hosting classrooms in DR Congo, uh, in Kenya, in South Sudan and Tanzania, and have reached more than 86,000 students and 1,000 teachers. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce Andrew Dunnett, uh, who is the Group Director for SDGs, Sustainable Business and Foundations for Vodafone, to talk to us more about their work in refugee settings, um, the lessons that have been learned, and also about Vodafone's role as a private sector partner in the Global Coalition for Education. Andrew. Thank you. Hi. Well, thanks for uh, inviting us to, to join this wonderful call, and it's great to see so many uh, uh, friends and colleagues on the call. It's lovely to see Filippo, uh, who I haven't seen since lockdown began, uh, and it's great to be part of this uh, this conversation. I mean, I, you know, I, I I suppose the starting point for us is that um, when people have very lim limited access to the written word, when they get connected, they get access to anything that's ever been written, uh, and that is a revolution that is taking place in our lifetime. And and many of the ministers uh, on the call will be very familiar with that. And um, so really for the last six or seven years, we've been trying to work out how can we make a contribution? Uh, how can we as a company, both uh, as a company, but also through its uh, charitable program, uh, make the biggest impact in terms of our investment? And, and so uh, as you referenced in the, in the introduction, uh, we felt that uh, our primary purpose would be connectivity, uh, but to partner with those who specialize in content uh, to provide a solution which uh, enabled scale and sustainability. Uh, because while we're obviously all very familiar with the innovation, uh, I mean, if you take 10 years ago, less than 1% less than, less than, uh, of the world's population were constantly connected. Now 4 billion of us are constantly connected. So, so how do we use that connected revolution to enable those at the margins uh, and, and with, in, in danger of being left behind to really be part of that? And that's where we began the partnership with UNHCR, uh, really as a test bed to see what we could do in places like the minister will know Kakuma uh, and in other camps and really begin to see if the power of that connectivity could transform the, transform the learning, uh, in particular looking at areas of uh, obviously exam results, but also looking at attendance, uh, looking at continuous professional development of teachers. Uh, and then for the children, looking at confidence, motivation, uh, all of these less tangible in terms of measurable, but equally important outcome. Uh, and that's the journey we're on. And I was delighted just for Christmas, uh, our global CEO, Felipe, announced that we would be looking at uh, working with half a million students by 2025. We baked in the money. Uh, it's there. Uh, we're now uh, progressing to roll that out to just under 300 schools uh, and working with the various ministries of education. Uh, you know, for 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 the, the countries in which we're operating. So so that's what we're about, um, because we believe actually the power of connectivity is going to be transformational uh, in in the way that uh, that people learn. We've learned a lot. If you want me to answer that question, you know, we have um, we we've learned a lot along the way. Um, I mean, what, one of the things we've learned is that it doesn't matter where you are in the world, young people are very intolerant if you don't give them exactly what they want in two clicks. Uh, you, you know what I mean? You can have all the content uh, that, uh, you know, that, that is out there and there's no shortage of content. But I think one of the things that we have learned is that uh, uh, young people you know, need to get that content very rapidly. Um, otherwise, there is a, a drop off in terms of interest. I think the other thing that we've learned, uh, in particular, there are a number of people on, on the call who either in terms of the ministerial portfolio or in terms of their personal commitment, you know, extraordinary impact in that, in that area. Obviously, we've worked in the LAR Fund uh, and, and, and been very uh, committed to their amazing, uh, you know, their amazing cause. But maybe if I just sort of give you one uh, extraordinary moment we had um, in a Kenyan refugee camp uh, I think it was, uh, it could have been Dadaab, but I think it was Kakuma. And um, we, there was an instant classroom where we have, you know, 25 tablets, uh, all, all, all the, uh, the projector, and they were having a lesson uh, using the very best uh, technology to learn. And um, as always, when an adult goes into a, a schoolroom situation, you know, it's like having an alien come into the room. It's slightly sort of debilizing. Uh, who are these people and why are they here? Uh, and um, so the teacher stopped and, and, and we were chatting and, and um, then they said, does anyone have a question for our guests? They explained who we were and why we were coming to, to listen and be part of the class. 
Um, and as often, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's the girls who stand up and talk more than the boys. Uh, and this girl stood up and uh, I'd like to, um, uh, in a very halting way, I'd like to thank Vodafone because as a result of this technology in the classroom, I had to get married. Uh, and then she sat down. And um, I asked the teacher through an interpreter, could, could, could she just sort of explain a little bit more her story? Because this is why you come and, you know, you can read the reports and you can read the data, but actually you want to come and, and feel it and see what's happening. And um, she said um, she didn't want to say any more. Uh, and so that was the end of it. And at the end of it, I said, could I have a chat with her? And I talked her. And uh, she said this, her parents were illiterate uh, and they wanted her to get married. They didn't see the point of the school. So the, the teacher, who's an employee of, uh, of the whole program that we run in the camp, a refugee themselves, took a tablet uh, and showed to the parents all that the, the daughter was learning through the instant schools program. And as a result of seeing it, although she couldn't, uh, parents couldn't actually read it or, or, or understand it. As a result of that, uh, they said that she could carry on learning uh, because they could see that she was getting a lot of value from this, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool and we're delighted to be working with uh, UNHCR as a partner. Uh, we've got a really stretched target, uh, a really stretched target. Uh, and for us, it's about sustainability and scale in the long term not about a sort of corporate program that comes in for a moment and then is lost. That, that, that's our ambition. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrew, for that. And thank you for Vodafone's leadership uh, within the sector. Um, I think that's been really interesting and it's fantastic as we are looking at, at kind of distance and online learning in COVID for refugees to remember that we have lessons from programmes and opportunities that we've been taking prior to this. Um, I mean, I think it's clear from all the participants so far that the only way to ensure that refugee students and their families have the opportunity to continue with an education and why that education is so important um, is for different stakeholders to come together. Um, and we heard from, from Bahati and from the Special Envoy how important it is that this includes refugees themselves, as well as teachers and community supporters who are there on the ground day in, day out, um, playing these really crucial roles in keeping learning going in refugee settings. Um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Ag Mohammed Ahmed Ali, uh, who himself had to flee violence in Mali, and he became a refugee in Burkina Faso at the age of 17. After finishing his baccalaureate, Ahmed has worked tirelessly as a community mobilizer and as a teacher, including providing much needed encouragement and support to students and to their families during the COVID-19 school closures in Burkina. Um, Ahmed, it's a pleasure to turn over to you. Bonsoir, uh, je suis très content d'être parmi vous ce soir. Uh, ouais, comme vous l'avez dit, je m'appelle Ahmed, je m'appelle Ali, je suis réfugié malien au Burkina Faso depuis uh, 2012. Voilà, bon. Uh, dans notre zone ici, vraiment, l'éducation a été vraiment touchée avant l'avènement même du coronavirus par l'insécurité, par l'insécurité de prime abord dans la zone uh, du Sahel. Les activités éducatives ont été perturbées depuis la fin de l'année 2017 dans la région du Sahel au Burkina Faso. La plupart des écoles ont été fermées à cause des de, de, de problèmes sécuritaires. Euh, en fait, euh, déjà, on avait des problèmes de sécurité quand la pandémie s'est venue. On est rentré dans une situation vraiment catastrophique pour l'éducation et surtout pour les couches les plus vulnérables qui sont les réfugiés et les, réfugiés et les personnes déplacées. Parce que nous sommes dans une région vraiment de déplacés, de réfugiés, de vulnérables. C'est une région vraiment, vraiment vulnérable. Euh, J'ai servi en tant qu'enseignant dans les camps de, de réfugiés ou entre, entre la communauté d'où je suis. Euh, après, j'ai été recruté par les, les HCR, initiative des HCR qui, qui consiste à inclure des réfugiés, à inclure des euh, réfugiés. Je tiens à saluer, à saluer monsieur le, le, le haut commissaire qui est venu nous rendre visite là où je suis actuellement ici, dans un coin vraiment très lointain que monsieur Philippe Grandi connaît. Il a été ici il n'y a pas très longtemps. Je le remercie pour cela. Euh, nous essayons de faire tout ce qui est possible pour euh, que l'éducation continue avec les réfugiés, mais ce n'est pas du tout très facile. Le gouvernement n'a vraiment pas les moyens nécessaires. Nous sommes dans un pays pauvre où tout manque. Il y a eu, après, après la fermeté des écoles à cause de, de la pandémie, il y a eu des programmes qui passent à la télé, à la radio, mais 
les, les couches les plus vulnérables encore, qui sont les réfugiés et les, 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 les déplacés, n'ont pas accès à ces moyens de communication. C'est en ce sens-là qu'aujourd'hui, avec l'aide des HCR, euh, on est en train de, de distribuer des radios à des, à des élèves, à des élèves réfugiés de la communauté haute, à des élèves déplacés, où on essaye de, de doter chaque enfant d'une radio rechargeable où il puisse au moins écouter les cours à la radio. Ça, ce n'est pas gagné, ce n'est pas vraiment gagné, parce qu'il y a les couches qui sont les handicapés, par exemple, les sourds, les malentendants qui ne vont pas bénéficier de ces programmes ou bien qui ne vont pas en tirer euh, profit de ces programmes-là. Mais on, la réflexion continue. On espère qu'il y aura une autre solution. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Ahmed. That's fabulous. I think there's the, the solutions you talked about with radio are crucial, but the solutions that community mobilizers, teachers and supporters such as yourself are able to put in place are even more important. Um, recognizing that supporting the needs of refugees really does include multiple stakeholders. The Global Compact on Refugees was signed in 2018, and it tried to set out ways to come together. One aspect of the Global Compact was the recognition that the international community needs to do more to support countries which host refugees. So staying in West Africa, um, we'd like to hear from another minister, and I'm really pleased to turn over uh, to Professor Nalova Lyonga, the Minister for Secondary Education in Cameroon, uh, which hosts more than 400,000 refugees. Uh, minister Lyonga, over to you. Minister, I think you're still on mute. Apologies. Okay, can you hear me now? It's unmuted now. Okay. Now, uh, I just wanted to thank everybody and thank the hosts of this conference, uh, bringing us together to talk about what I think is very, very important to humanity. The point about including everybody in the world, in the society, and therefore in the world. And for me, talking about refugees means you're talking about your society. Because what is happening to refugees is not just the refugees, but to some sections of the population of my own country or some other person's country. They are humans like us. They miss things that other people miss. The first thing that I want to talk about is how the awareness of the condition of refugees can make people become empathetic to what is happening in the world. You know, I mean, uh, Cameroon has those refugees, but somebody, some people are not aware of it because we do not discriminate against refugees. But it is quite good, I believe, that everybody should be aware of the conditions of refugees. But the good thing about Cameroon, you know, is that it considers everybody on an even par. And therefore, those refugees who go to school, go to school like everybody else. In my secondary schools, we don't have any distinction, we don't make any distinction between the refugee and the Cameroonian. All of us are the same. The principle, in secondary education in Cameroon is the best for all. If we want the best for all, be it a refugee, be it a Cameroonian, we all have to go through that. What has happened with the pandemic is that Cameroonian government, the Cameroonian government has become, you know, has, has now known that they have to look for a solution that takes in everybody. One of the things that we, we uh, looked at was the fact that, or what we were worried about was the fact that there should be no blank year. And if there is a blank year, is it just the refugee who suffers? Is it just the Cameroonian who suffers? No, it is everybody who suffers. For the first time, Cameroonians were really getting the pains of you know, looking at the possibility of having a blank year if we did not find a solution. A blank year 
for a parent hurts. It hurts everybody. And therefore, you know, people began to look at whether we're going to have a blank year or we're not going to have a blank year. Now that is so important because then you become aware of what somebody feels who is not going to school. And that is what the refugees feel. For the first time, we could feel that children were going to be roaming the streets alone, that we're going to have unwanted pregnancies because they're not going to school. Those, that idleness, all of that, childless marriages, those are the same problems that the refugees go through. Now, what did we do? Distance education. Distance education with multiple formats, the radio, the TV, print, online, everybody, whether you have electricity or not, you are able to have that. And that's how come we took uh, distance education. And distance education beyond the uh, pandemic means that we're going to have a hybrid model of distance education, where distance education would not be just for the period when the pandemic is on, but beyond the period of the, of the pandemic. We're going to take a, 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 an approach that would give a kind of education that would, uh, that would uh, allow everybody to be part of it, an inclusive model that takes care of normal kids because normal kids would have overcrowding if you did not have distance education. It would take care of refugees. It would take care of children in the conflict zone or what we call IDPs. It would take care of physically challenged children, the handicapped, et cetera, et cetera. So in fact, once the uh, head of state locked down Cameroon from the 17th, I was extended to the 30th, everybody began to feel what everybody feels, including a refugee. And therefore, you can see that we had to begin to work, get to smart solutions, quick decisions in order to get to smart, solu smart solutions. And so distance education is that. And what did we find in Cameroon that gave us that impetus? Cameroon is dominated by IT uh, communication technology. And yet, do we use it? We don't use it. 90%, there's 90% mobile penetration in Cameroon. There's 30% internet penetration in Cameroon. And the estimated 27 million people that we have all take part in some electronic, electronic form of transaction because they're able to send money transfers, get health news, do social media, our children are abroad, you know, you have to communicate with them, you know, and there is, there are all those needs that made it possible for us to think about the solution. For us, the solution was that the mobile phone, mobile uh, method of doing things, had made us so aware of communication possibilities and we wondered why this was not used in communication. So that had to be used in communication. Distance education would be exploited for its benefits. We forge, we mold, we give it body. That is what an idea is. And that is how we will be able to meet our, our children, to meet the refugees whom we want so much to give the same education as the Cameroonians. And therefore, is it possible that we in Cameroon can reach these children who are refugees? Yes. And we looked at uh, distance education as that technology, as that business, which is really unfinished in the technical revolution. Distance education is an answer to our uh, use, to our treatment of uh, any of these people, refugees and everything. Now the technical infrastructure challenges, which we have, we are hoping that we shall overcome those. 
We need to overcome those in order to have these refugees come with us in the classrooms, wherever we are, so that they are not refugees, they are Ghana, call them wherever they are coming from, but overall they are Cameroonians in the way we treat them. So, uh, in fact, if we can be helped with certain uh, facilities, such as the tablets or the smartphone, to interact with teachers, so that these children can interact with their teachers and the world around them, uh, things that the government is unable to pay for, I think that this will help. And we are going to improve the life of the refugees. Refugees are contributors like all of us. Refugees have problems which some of our children may have. So let us continue to work for the benefit of everyone and the refugees will be part of that whole uh, benefit, of those who will benefit from it. That is what I want to say about our contribution to a form of learning that will bring everybody into the picture using, uh, uh, using a, a system where every refugee becomes part of the Cameroonian society. Distance education has been missing. Here is the time when we should be aware of what it is, its benefits. The Cameroon government is aware, our partners are aware, and let us do more in order to make the country even. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. That was very inspiring. I think the story of Cameroon and the work towards inclusion and equitable access to quality education for all, recognizing refugees and particular needs within host communities is such an important call to action. Um, that idea of looking towards getting the best for all, I think is exactly what we're talking about um, in this round table. Um, because of some of the delay we had at the start, I'm going to just make one change. Um, so I'd like to hand over uh, to Baroness Liz Sugg, um, and after Baroness Sugg has spoken, um, we'll go back to the original running order. Um, Baroness Sugg is the UK Special Envoy for Girls Education, so thank you. Thank you, and it's great to be here. Really good to hear from some of the generous host countries, Kenya and Cameroon, and I think Pakistan later on, and of course from Vodafone. We really need more public-private sector involvement to be part of the solution. Um, of course, I'd also like to thank the young refugees we've heard from today and amid this unprecedented global crisis, Fahati and Ahmed inspire us and they make me optimistic that our shared future is in good hands. And it's really vital that all of our responses are guided by their experiences and their needs. And as we've heard today, the plight of refugees is exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And refugees, as we know, are among the most vulnerable, often at higher risk of poverty and malnutrition and lack access to proper health care or shelter, with women and girls being disproportionately affected. And for now, the international community is rightly focused on the impacts of COVID-19, which has affected us here in the UK and all around the world. But even before the pandemic, we were already in the midst of a global learning crisis, with refugees and displaced children making up the largest group of those out of school. And at the peak of global school closures, COVID-19 has kept one and a half billion children and young people out of school. And as the UNHCR Special Envoy highlighted, half of all secondary age girls will not return when classrooms open. And so if we are truly to build back better, which we all want to do, education must be prioritised in the global recovery from coronavirus. It's really clear from our discussions today that this epidemic is not just a health crisis, it's an education crisis, especially for refugee children, which is why it's essential to ensure that education systems not only recover, but recover better, providing all children with the skills to survive and to thrive. And with an education, these children will be unable to rebuild their lives and achieve their full potential. 
We're therefore grateful for UNESCO convening the Global Education Coalition, which has brought together multilateral partners, private sector organisations and NGOs in response to the crisis. And the UK is proud of our support to UNESCO's Institute for Statistics, which is leading the push on education data, which is vital to ensure that the responses reach those most in need. In the last four months, the UK has adapted and reprioritised our education programmes in 18 countries we work to support education systems and help keep people safe during the pandemic. And we fully recognise the importance of including refugees and national responses in line with the Global Compact on Refugees. And of course, we must not forget the role of teachers like Amit in refugee education. Refugee children and their communities rely on teachers to provide education, but in this pandemic, they're relied on for so much more, including psychosocial support and vital health information. So I'm really delighted to announce today 5.3 million pounds of new UK funding to UNHCR, which will enable more than 5,000 teachers to provide that vital education for children in 10 refugee hosting countries over the crucial next seven months. And this funding will ensure children can continue to benefit from education during school closures and will mean teachers can provide vital outreach to get children back to school once they reopen. We know that supporting every child's right to 12 years of quality education is one of the best investments we can make to end the cycle of displacement, poverty and conflict as we recover from coronavirus. This is a major development priority for us here in the UK, but it will require a global effort. The UK will be backing UNICEF's Open Up Better campaign and many other efforts to get children back to school when it's safe to do so. And we must place the needs of refugees and the most vulnerable children at the heart of that process. So thank you. And I look forward to our continued work together to ensure that our efforts help those that need it most. Thank you so much, Verena Sagan. Thank you for that exciting announcement. Um, I think it's important as we're thinking about the work of multiple stakeholders, recognising that need for funding and for additional resources. Um, we've known for a long time as the international community that education is traditionally underfunded during humanitarian responses and receives just about 2% of overall funds. Education Cannot Wait or ECW was established exactly to ensure that children get opportunities to, to the education and to the future they deserve. Uh, supported by donors like the UK and the Canadian government, um, ECW has actually been one of the few funds that's been able to really rally around and try to meet the needs of refugees and other particularly vulnerable communities during the COVID-19 response in education. Um, I'm really pleased to turn to Yasmin Sharif, uh, the Director of Education Cannot Wait, to tell us more about their response. Thank you very much, Becky, and thank you UNHR um, and um, Canada and the UK for inviting Education Cannot Wait. Um, thank you the UNHR Special Envoy, uh, Angelina, for a very inspiring opening, and thank you all great uh, ministers in countries where we work, like uh, Cameron and, and Kenya, Verstone, and also private sector. So education cannot wait. We, we are a global fund. We don't implement. This is very important. The ones that implement on the ground is NHR, it's UNESCO, it's UNICEF, it's all the civil society. They are doing the real work on the ground. What, what we do is to, to, to use utilize resources to leverage a new way of working together but there's no competition we bring everyone together and we focus together on those who are left furthest behind and advocating for uh, refugee education um, because refugees is from our perspective and we all know the ones left furthest behind from achieving the sustainable development goals uh, uh, and why is it so? I mean, look at this. You are a, a refugee has been dispossessed in every single possible way, uh, whether it is they lose their home, they lose their home country, they have to cross an international border, often fleeing with barely the clothes on their body. And then they are in a new country uh, where they may not always be the top priority 
uh, because they are not the nationals of the country. And that's so wonderful to hear today how Cameroon um, and, and Kenya and many others are doing their best to treat refugees as their own nationals. But what we often see is that refugees are, have difficulties accessing uh, public education, uh, be part of the national plans, and, and, and therefore um, are, are left to fend for themselves. So they are clearly amongst those who are left furthest behind as we try to create a more um, 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 fairer world, also socioeconomically and in future hope and, and possibilities. So as a result of this, um, Education Cannot Wait has moved forward very fast in response to COVID-19. And thanks to generous contributions from Canada, from UK, from the, uh, the, the, from the US, um, from private sector and others. And we had the first round already in April, which was um, a record time. And we, we used Martin Luther King's uh, quote, the fierce urgency of now. You have to move now. It's not about next year or uh, 10 years from now. That's why we are very impatient. And we had the first round in April, but then we said only some of that reached refugees. So in the second round, we're going to dedicate it completely to refugees. And we work very closely with civil society focusing on refugees. And of course, with UNHR uh, as the great uh, refugee agency. And we identified 10 countries. Uh, Kenya is one of them. Cameroon is another one where we will focus exclusively and delivering, um, investing about $20 million in the days to come. Um, and continuously, of course, with more investments. Uh, what do these investments look like? Um, there's distance learning, um, and accelerated learning, um, home-based teaching, um, provision of school materials, technology where this is possible, where this is possible. I mean, large part of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, don't have the infrastructure. You go to a country like Central African Republic, uh, go outside this Kabul in Afghanistan. There is no infrastructure for technology. So we take that into account. But also, and this has been mentioned here by, by Baroness Sag and by many others, the importance of mental health and, and psychosocial services to deal with all the traumas while you are in the refuge and also accessing learning. So, so hygiene, mental health, sanitation, and protection above all. Um, these are part of the investments that education cannot wait makes um, the financial investments together uh, with all our um, colleagues in the UN agency, civil society, and not the least the, the ministers of uh, education in country with whom we work very closely. Um, now, final question then, what do you learn from that? We all know that in the crisis, you have two choices. One is to succumb and just give up or take that crisis and go to a better place and build back better afterwards. And I think there are two things we are learning from the COVID-19 crisis um, for refugees is that, that the, um, there's a technology divide. And that's why it's so wonderful to see Vodafone, Vodafone and many other private sector companies coming in. But there is there's the technology divide. And we now realize what huge part of the world, including the refugees in those countries, cannot access technology because of socioeconomic inequity, which that's the reality. You don't have the infrastructure and therefore you cannot benefit from technology. Uh, and that then deepens the, the education divide. So that, that's the, the, the dark part of it. But then again, you never give up. And refugees never give up as we could hear Ahmad and Bahati here um, so strongly plugging forward despite what they are challenged with. Um, so we have to take it to a new level and build back better. And we, we see the opportunity here um, for, for um, how we can improve education on the move, as we say, for those who are fleeing, for those who have left their home countries through technology when they have access. We've done that with uh, refugees on the Greek islands and asylum seekers where we can use WhatsApp and radio um, and, and, in, and in other parts of the world where it's possible and also find new creative ways of delivering education for those who are constantly moving or are not living in the homes of religion. And finally, it's a wonderful opportunity, especially with everyone here today, is um, to be able to do the advocacy for refugees and lift them up and make them seen and visible. They are left borders behind, but in reality, 
municipality, they should be at the forefront of our conscience um, uh, because they are the ones that will rebuild a world torn apart in so many ways today. And that's why I'm also happy and congratulate UNHR for the UK's um, pledge today. I'm very happy. We, we uh, so enjoy working with UNHR. We enjoy being part of UNESCO's global coalition for education, coordinating and bringing us all together. And most of all, happy to see great education ministers and the most wonderful resilient refugees on earth. Thank you very much uh, from Education Cannot Wait. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Um, we're really always so pleased to hear from ETW and how you're driving forward some of the critical response. Um, one exciting thing to note is that today is actually the first day of um, the Humanitarian Education Accelerators Boot Camp. Uh, the HEA is uh, funded by ECW and it looks at, um, in this time of COVID, building on a challenge call which was launched by the EdTech Hub um, and the M Education Alliance. Over 80 partners from around the world put forward solutions and that includes solutions um, from refugee community-based organizations themselves. Um, and the boot camp, which is starting this week is bringing together a group of those partners to further understand approaches in particularly distance and online learning and data collection during COVID. Um, and I wanted to mention that particularly because I understand that um, a lot of the um, participants from that boot camp are um, watching this on YouTube and are con contributing very positively uh, to the discussion. So thank you again to ECW for that. I think we've talked a lot about how important collective action is, how pivotal that coming together is um, to address the challenges that COVID-19 has presented for refugees and for host communities. We're holding this roundtable under the UNESCO-led Global Education Coalition, which obviously aims to bring together multiple actors um, who can add their own unique voice to the effort, um, and that includes uh, our final government speaker, um, Ms. Wajiha Akram, who is the parliamentary secretary uh, to the Minister, Ministry of Federal and Professional Training in Pakistan. Um, COVID-19 resulted in national school closures impacting all children in Pakistan and the government was able to launch a telescreen programme in April covering grades 1 to 12 which is broadcast every day through the national TV channel. This is an incredible success and effort and we really look forward to hearing more um, from the parliamentary secretary on how they were able to respond so quickly to so many of the education needs um, including looking at how to include refugees in their national education response and resilience plan. Um, so I'm really delighted to turn over to Ms. Akram um, to tell us more about your experiences during COVID-19, where you found challenges and solutions in ensuring that children can continue to learn and plan for a return. Thank you, Angelina, UNHCR, UNESCO, and everyone present here. I would like to just say that I'm honored to be amongst such overwhelmingly inspiring people each of you have done for your countries and communities is amazing. Bahati, I would say that you are truly awe-inspiring, truly amongst the hardest of circumstances, are heroes born. And Muhammad Ali Ahmad, you too have an absolutely beautiful Just one second. I think we lost you for a second and I think you've come back on mute. Would you mind just trying to turn your mic back on? Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So um, I would like to start with what Pakistan is doing in this pandemic. There are over 1.42 million registered Afghan refugees residing in Pakistan, with 68% of these refugees living in either urban or semi-urban settings. Um, and there are um, over 32% which still live in refugee villages and remote territories. Out of the 1.42 million registered refugees living in Pakistan, over 500,000 are between the ages of 5 to 17, making them school going. Under the 18th Amendment of the Constitution of Pakistan, education is made free and compulsory for children between the ages of 5 and 16, making refugee children between this age bracket accessing both private and public schools. Along with that, UNHCR, uh, along with the Ministry of Saffron and Chief Commissioner of Afghan Refugees is providing primary and secondary education to over 57,000 refugee children in over 146 refugee villages. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has had an unmatched effect on all sectors of life, especially education. Both public and private schools have suffered, while many teachers and school staff went unemployed. It goes without a doubt that students suffered the huge losses. The challenges faced by refugee children can be described as threefold. The sudden closure of schools resulted in a disruption in learning for students with little to no support from their families. Most refugee families suffer financially and this pandemic, they have suffered at the hands of losses in businesses and unemployment, creating an environment of distress at home too. Secondly, for refugee families living in remote villages, villages access to online learning and classrooms is almost impossible. And thirdly, while the community suffers greatly, there is little to none support for education within the community. This is doubled for girls, since education of a girl child fell pretty low on the priority list, as is the teleschool. Um, the teleschool initiated by the Ministry of Federal Education is available along with online learning material. Uh, but it is not as accessible for refugees in remote villages with little to no internet access. It attempts to combat this that the Pakistan National Education Response and Resilient Plan for COVID-19 was developed jointly by UN agencies and the government of Pakistan. This recognizes the importance to ensure continuous learning for all children, urges all stakeholders, including education authorities and partners, to pay special attention to all children with vulnerabilities, including the refugees. Refugee children's need will be captured and addressed through a concerted response in close coordination with UNHCR and other partners. Federal and provincial governments have also adopted the framework for a reopening of schools developed by UNESCO, uh, UNICEF, WFP, and World Bank. The provincial governments are currently finalizing guidelines and protocols for safe reopening of schools from September 15, September 2020. Safety and health of students and teachers in schools are of utmost importance, of course, for all the children, including most vulnerable ones. Provincial governments are finalizing uh, their safe school reopening guidelines and SOPs, so to ensure the safe environment for, for children's learning. This includes up-to-date or WASH facilities in schools in disadvantaged uh, loca locations. And the government is taking a number of steps to ensure that vulnerable children, especially girls and refugee children, ret return to school when the schools reopen. Uh, some of these measures, for instance, development of content for different platforms and modalities according to levels, subjects, and grades based on the gap analysis. And this content includes both digital and non-digital, including audiovisual learning and uh, edutainment content for different platforms like TV, radio, web-based blogs, video sites, applications, and these will be accessible through smartphones as well. Along with that, supporting the government's efforts for promotion of girls' education, UNESCO Pakistan is impl uh, implementing a multi-layer and uh, multi-donor funded program, Malala Girls' Right to Education program in Pakistan, in 18 most marginalized and isolated districts of Pakistan. In response to COVID-19, to supplement the federal government for ensuring continuity of the learning process during school closure, UNESCO Pakistan and the Ministry of Federal Education is launching a radio program for an approximately uh, approximate six months time frame in 18 most uh, marginalized and isolated districts for primary school children in order to engage them in learning activities. Implementing of provisions of targeted support to poor households through cash grants and stipends for learners is also in pipeline. Implementation and expansion of remedial learning catch up programs for children who fall behind due to school closures. Strengthening the role of teachers, head teachers, and school, especially in refugees hosted areas and camps. Apart from this, a plea to parents to send children back to school. This way, will be accompanied by community outreaches that emphasizes the importance of education since we need to fight this together and the only way forward is together. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Akram, for those reflections. And we are starting to, to head toward the end of the discussions. And I think you just reflected all of the different things that have come up so far. Um, a real recognition of the courage and commitment uh, of ministries, of uh, NGOs of multilateral agencies and the refugees themselves and how that real commitment um, needs to come together to make sure that families and students are able to continue with their education. Um, so for the last key speaker I'd like to uh, turn to Naila Fahed. Uh, Naila is a Malala Fund education 
Egyptian champion in her home country of Lebanon. She's the co-founder and chief executive officer of the Lebanese Alternative Learning. Mm -hmm. Lebanon currently hosts one of the largest numbers of refugees per capita in the world and is facing multiple challenges um, currently, including with national poverty rates, which are, are really creating massive challenges for all families and students. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, around 56% of Syrian refugee school-aged children were enrolled in schools in Lebanon, though this rate has always dropped sharply as it moves to secondary education. In terms of gender, girls are faced with challenges that we've talked about already in this call, but child marriages, um, working on child labour, and then issues around economic factors, as well as safety and security. Recognising one of the main barriers uh, for education was language and that this was having an impact on education standards and making it difficult for Syrian refugee girls to enter the Lebanese public school system, Nilo was able to create a digital learning platform called Tabshura in a box, technology that works with no internet or electricity, aiming to help Syrian refugee girls to catch up on their education before formally enrolling in school. So Nila, over to you. Thank you for receiving uh, Lebanese uh, alternative of learning in this panel. Thank you all. So uh, I will do a quick presentation of the NGO very quick. I will then point the research we are doing and then give some of our findings. So Lebanese Alternative Learning is an educational technology NGO that offers offline free support program. Tabshura, tabshura means chalk. As well as offline access solution, Tabshura in a box and content creation workshop to vulnerable areas in Lebanon in an attempt to bridge the gap between the privileged and underprivileged access to quality education and ensure school retention. We equally work with host community and refugees. We are also part, as you mentioned, of Malala Fund and as such work closely mm -hmm. with girls and their teachers who often are refugee uh, women themselves. In the context in the context of a research we are currently conducting in Lebanon to identify which solution teacher adopted to respond to the multiple crises Lebanon is facing, in which I have to say COVID-19 is not the most uh, violent virus. We have much more viruses uh, going. So we met with teachers in several vulnerable areas of Lebanon and gathered the following data. In the context where there is no internet and more and more no restriction on electricity lately, it is impossible to provide online classes or to send video even compressed. The most used device to communicate between teacher and children uh, uh, is the mobile phone. Often the children have to wait uh, until the father comes home because he's the one who have mobile uh, phone uh, and share the time with the brother and sister. The most used apps in Lebanon is WhatsApp or uh, Telegram, which is another version of Messenger. Uh, the communication between student and teacher is limited to sending traditional homework. Some teachers tried videos or screen recording, but with very limited success, as videos consume internet data and are difficult to produce. Resources made available by international provider were not easy to adapt to the actual curriculum. Very few teachers used them, and I would say it was less than 2%. Parents were unable to help their children, as most of them have insufficient education. So this made us rethink, and I would like to rethink with you our beliefs when it comes to education in emergency. And I would like to highlight some of them, making those teacher voices heard, uh, teachers who are indeed our field heroes. Listening should always come first. Let's forget about our numbers, our KPIs, our output, outcome, impact, and just try to understand the reality of the teacher in vulnerable area, their priority, and make them part of a solution that often must be much simpler that's the one we create in a sophisticated matrix we write in our office in front of the screen. This brings me to the importance of empowering local actors, not only because they need jobs, not only because they are highly qualified and they are the only one who understands the most the reality of the field, not only because it is the only way a solution is sustainable, 
but also because they are the one who can save local culture, their history, art, literature, the universal heritage of humanity threatened by the globalization of an education that is becoming one taste for all. And for this, I would like to thank Malala Fon, who understood the importance of local actor and is empowering local NGOs all over the world. Don't import ready-made solution because it is easier. The argument of not reinventing the wheel is not valid. Wheel was reinvented several times. The wheel of the car you drive today only share with the carriage of the Middle Ages a circular shape. Canada have wheel adapted to snow and cold weather, while Saudi Arabia have wheels adapted to desert and heat. Ready-made solution give good conscience waste. Our good marketing to local actors, press conference material. We are applying this great management system using this very high and translated content. But if this is not part of a long-term strategy that is essential, and I would say especially in time of crisis, a strategy that is coming from the reality of a complex situation, if this is not part of a long-term education plan, it will only work during the implementation phase because teacher will be asked to use it. Flexibility, adaptability, there is no ideal solution or one solution for all. Any resources should be flexible and adaptable to different contexts and different needs. What I will be saying now can be unexpected. Please do not give us too much money. Money makes us greedy. We will try to adapt our solution, solution to the amount of money and not to the reality of the needs. Internally, decision maker in the country will take the solution that brings more money and ask for less amount of work and not necessarily the best one on a long-term basis. And I would like to close on an essential concept. Learning is about skills, competency, problem solving, concept approach, but this is not what learning is only about. Learning is about the forgotten philosophical concept of happiness. There is short-term happiness when a child is happy to learn or happy while learning. And there is long-term happiness in the fulfillment that learning gives you. I am sure you all remember a moment of your life when you understood an abstract concept or apply it. And this feeling of fulfillment it gives you. So let's add happiness as an essential component to all of our projects. Let's think about it as an important milestone. So be happy, keep learning, keep sharing your learning with the ones who need it most. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think that's a really fantastic note uh, to round off on. Uh, with our last speaker. So before I hand over to Filippo Grande for closing remarks, um, I'd just like to hand back to the special envoy. All right, I'm unmuted. Um, nothing prepared. I just, um, on that note of happiness and learning, it made me smile because I have feel I have really truly learned quite a lot in the last hour, hour and a half that we've all been talking. And I hope you do too. I, I feel sometimes we come into these because we've all been working on these issues for so long and we talk about these issues and sometimes they do seem like numbers and conferences and meetings and just another meeting and another grouping and we're not sure uh, what we're really accomplishing or how much we can do. I, I, what I hear from everyone is how this is a very different moment in our world, it's a very different moment, the way we can come together, the solutions that are being found, the work that's being done, um, what's being learned and the listening on the ground to others and really, really hearing and those who spoke up who are refugees today and, and to, to all of those in your countries who have hosted for so long and are hosting now. Um, we, we, we know a lot of what needs to be done and I am, hoping that we will all continue to be in very close contact and that this is the first of many conversations and that in this next uh, few months, year ahead and, and into the future, but especially the next few months, year ahead, we stay very, very close and make sure we try to um, uh, work together, pull our efforts, um, because I, I, I believe we, we can accomplish quite a lot. 
So thank, thank you all for, for sharing. I have learned a great deal. Becky, shall I just take the floor? Please do, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Angelina, as well. And uh, I think uh, uh, everything has been said already, so uh, it's very difficult to wrap up. But uh, uh, the, the last words that Naila shared with us, which Angelina also referred to, are very inspiring, I think, because they bring back to the core issue here. And the core issue is that uh, uh, education is, um, is a fulfillment of ourselves. And uh, if, it, uh, if, it, uh, if it is or remains or becomes a privilege, uh, we are missing something very big in today's world. And if education is not for everybody, then it is inevitably a privilege. And everything that uh, uh, you and we have been discussing today is exactly about that, about including, including uh, everybody in the education, which is the aspiration of SDG4, as you know, including everybody in, uh, in education. In, and in this inclusion, we must include further also those that are uh, perhaps among the most excluded, not the, own, not the most excluded, but among the most excluded, people on the move, people that have no more home, no more country, often no more family, and that uh, are left to their own devices. So I am very pleased to have heard this emphasis on inclusion by, uh, by everybody from different perspectives. The other consideration I wanted to make is that some of you have mentioned the Global Compact on Refugees. The Global Compact on Refugees is, uh, uh, rests on an important foundation that responding to a crisis of forced displacement cannot be left only to one set of actors, but needs to bring together governments, civil society, NGOs, networks uh, like uh, Education uh, Cannot Wait, business, businesses like uh, uh, Vodafone, and above all, perhaps refugees. And we have heard very eloquent statements from Bahati and Ahmed today. So it's interesting because uh, today in this uh, virtual meeting, we have all these actors. Somehow the the Global Compact is enacted around the all-important issue of education, which is at the center of the compact, uh, by uh, the cooperation, by the exchanges among ourselves that we have had today. And uh, in this respect, uh, let me join, of course, everybody in thanking UNESCO for convening uh, uh, this, uh, this discussion, but also for their leadership uh, in, in education, of course. Um, I would like to thank uh, our special, our very special envoy, Angelina Jolie, for her always passionate um, support, I would say, not just of refugees, but uh, of their value as human being. And we heard it once again in her opening statement today. I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, the refugees, as I said, who spoke so eloquently demonstrating that, uh, as if there was a need to demonstrate that, how important their contributions can be. And uh, a very special thanks to the ministers and officials of the three host countries, of uh, Cameroon, of Pakistan, and Kenya. These are three very important partners of my organization. These are three countries that have especially distinguished themselves in an excellent hospitality to refugees. Some like Pakistan for more than 40 years, Kenya also for a very long period of time, and Cameroon uh, also has been uh, uh, involved in refugee protection for many years, and now with the crisis in the Lake Chad region, in the Sahel, uh, but also in, uh, in, uh, in Chad and Central African Republic, it is also on the forefront. Um, and in that respect, I think it was significant that uh, we had these important pledges by Canada, by the United Kingdom, and I want to thank those two governments, hoping that they will just 
lead the way for other governments to follow their, uh, their example. Um, the next consideration I want to make is that um, much as all this is, is fine and good and positive, and uh, thank you, of course, also Yasmin and Andrew for the, your different but a very important contribution. You know, in the beginning when Education Cannot Wait was launched, I was very suspicious. I said, oh, no, not another forum, network, channel. But now, of course, I am completely converted and a great supporter of that, uh, uh, of that, um, of that uh, initiative. And uh, of course, as I am uh, uh, for the Vodafone, very concrete, practical, but all important contribution to uh, connected learning, especially in Africa. So these are key contributions to, to this debate, but we should make no mistakes. The bigger picture, and this is the thought I wanted to go to, the bigger picture remains very grim. And the uh, COVID-19, the Corona crisis has made, as many of you have already flagged, more grim. Um, my colleagues shared with me some statistics today. For example, that, that uh, the economic impact of lockdowns and of the COVID response are estimated to put 40 to 60 million children into deeper poverty. And uh, we also know, we also fear, we don't know, I hope we fear wrongly, but we fear that uh, the economic crisis will, may also have an impact on uh, longer term aid budgets, maybe not so much on humanitarian assistance, but on longer term assistance. Bearing in mind, this is another statistic that uh, was shared with me, 12% of uh, education activities in uh, poorer countries are supported by international aid. we risk having an education crisis in many countries. Remember, 90% of refugees and fundamentally almost all the internally displaced people live in countries that do not have much resources and therefore depend on international aid. If international aid uh, recedes or uh, um, uh, declines even for a number of months or years, the risk to uh, uh, to the welfare, to the support of these displaced populations is, is very high. And it is very high, as several of you have pointed out, in, um, in uh, how they will impact uh, uh, refugee girls in particular. Now, the compact, as I said, is a response that we designed uh, in past years to the global refugee crisis. It is a response, provides responses, I think, that uh, have proven quite effective also in a situation of global emergency like the, the corona crisis. The, the, we were just discussing here with colleagues, the compact has really changed the language we use uh, in aspects of our work for refugees, such as education, uh, and uh, has introduced a whole set of new concepts. You know, when I started doing refugee work, and unfortunately, that that's a very long time ago, more than 30 years ago. Education for refugees meant essentially building schools in refugee camps. This, this is what it was. And finding money, which was a big struggle, to pay salaries for teachers. Now, this may still be necessary in some context. But much more importantly, I think, the discussion and the three government representatives today uh, demonstrated very clearly. The discussion is shifting away from a separate track of assistance for refugees, much more into including refugees in national programs. But what the, does that mean? That means that those national programs, especially for countries that struggle for resources, have to be supported by the uh, international by the international community. So I think that this this is. The, the, these are the parameters of the compact. This is what we discussed last year, just before COVID, at the, the um, Global Refugee Forum. A around this concept, many pledges were made at the Global Refugees Forum, and I think it will be extremely important to follow up, and we're doing that, 
uh, on those pledges so that they can be uh, implemented in this situation. Because now, in addition to inclusion, we have to invest also in uh, additional resources to allow children that have been taken away from schools by the coronavirus to go back uh, to go back and resume their education. And you have mentioned many of these activities. You have mentioned distance learning. I was very happy to hear from some of you that you think of distance learning not just as an emergency measure, but also as a as a as a good innovative way of uh, learning for the future that may be applied beyond the corona the corona crisis. But you know, you know, we can we can. Uh, we can really look at the more in a more granular way at many other things that need to be done for example you know one one classic example is you know ensure that all schools schools uh, that host refugees but in fact all schools in a in a national education system have appropriate water and sanitation facilities because we are telling children that it is important to wash hands these are these are, you know, very practical interventions that we uh, we can uh, we can um, uh, pursue, and uh, very very important because I fear that in the context that we will deal with, and we heard from Naila about Lebanon, which is very emblematic from this point of view, we will uh, see beyond the health crisis if a colossal and very devastating uh, crisis of poverty that will affect refugees and host communities likewise. So it is important that when we talk about inclusion, we do not limit ourselves with education, but we look at it in a more, uh, in a broader way. The inclusion that the compact promotes is in fact inclusion in health systems. We have seen it in a very relevant way with the coronavirus emergency, but also including inclusion in social safety nets. And this is where it gets extremely difficult because for governments, this is politically the most difficult thing to do, including refugees, including foreigners, essentially, in a, a social safety nets at a time when nationals are also under pressure. But without that, if families of students remain in poverty, uh, we fear, as some of you have mentioned, that many will not be allowed to go to, back to school. Many refugees will not be allowed because girls in particular will marry early or will be forced to mar marry early. And many children will be obliged to work instead of, uh, instead of learning. Um, I want to just uh, conclude uh, once again by uh, uh, really uh, emphasizing this concept of inclusion. You know, the, um, I, uh, I took note of uh, what uh, um, uh, what uh, the Minister of Education of, uh, of Cameroon said, because it struck me. You know, Minister, you said uh, in Cameroon, many people are not even aware that we have uh, such a large number of refugees. Minister, I have hardly ever heard this from a government, and it made me very happy, because you explained this issue. You said, in a way, the inclusion comes natural. People understand that to the point, to a point where uh, uh, one does not distinguish. Now, I don't say this to diminish the phenomenal burden that this presence represents from you, for your governments, as it does for other governments, Pakistan and Kenya, that have spoken today. But I want to flag how important your statement is. That's ultimately what we want to achieve. We want people not to say you're a refugee and therefore you have to have a separate set of rules and education. You know, be welcome to our education system. But then, of course, we need to support, we need to help you support this education system because it will be uh, burdened by an additional number of people. But that statement that you made, uh, you know, many people are not even aware of refugees is a beautiful statement. Thank you for that. It should really inspire all of us as we go forward with the many initiatives mentioned today and uh, um, with this uh, collective action for education for everybody, including refugees. Thank you very much, uh, UNESCO. Thank you, Special Envoy. Thank you, uh, all speakers. And uh, thank you, Becky, for your uh, 
facilitation. Over to you to just close, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, High Commissioner and Special Envoy. I think you've, you've said everything. For, for me, it's been a massive privilege and an honour um, to be supporting this event with all of you fabulous people. Um, so thank you very much and we will close it there. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.